Welcome. I'm Patrick Honehan, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this webinar, the latest in the series of webinars organized by the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin, an IIEA webinar. Today we have a very interesting speaker, Luis de Guindos, Vice President of the European Central Bank. Let me just say a few housekeeping uh, remarks at the beginning. First of all, the event is on the record, so in case you hope you're going to be hiding behind uh, uh, Chatham House or Europe House rules, you're not, not today. This is on the record, um, both the uh, introductory remarks and the Q&A. Q&A is very important, um, and I, I think um, you all have an opportunity to uh, I just tell you how to do the Q&A, because there are various ways uh, in, in these uh, webinar series. In this case, in Zoom, we're using the Q&A function. Don't use any other function. You'll either find it on the top of your screen or on the bottom of your screen. But when you're asking a question, better to say who you are and uh, wh where you come from. Uh, I'll collect these questions and, and um, uh, process them and, and pass them along to uh, Luis in the course of the discussion later on. So, Luis Guindos is a Vice President of the European Central Bank. He was appointed to that position on the 1st of, of June 2018. It's an eight-year term. Of course, that makes him a member of the Executive Board, the six-person Executive Board of the ECB, a member of the Governing Council and the General Council. Um, before that, he was a Minister of Economy, Industry and Competitiveness in Spain. It was 2016 to 2018. Minister of Economy and Competitiveness without Industry, I don't know why, 2011 to 2016. Before that, he had a lengthy career, public and private sector, Secretary of State for Economic Affairs, member of the Economic and Financial Committee of the European Union, so on and so forth. So he got a wide experience, both public and private sectors, both government and central banking. And he's going to talk to us uh, today about, well, obviously, monetary policy, European central banks, uh, reaction to the pandemic crisis. We were hoping he would come to Dublin a couple of months ago, and that was before the crisis. And now we're in the crisis, and he's here, but only virtually. It's not his first time in Dublin. He spent some time here many, many years ago as a student, as he's told me before, and we were recalling Dublin in the old days just a few minutes ago. But let me pass over now to Luis de Guindos, Vice President of the European Central Bank. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. For me, it's a real pleasure uh, to share my views today during this webinar. Uh, and, uh, you know, as Patrick has said before, uh, I would have liked very much to go to Dublin, you know, my second favorite uh, town in the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have a lot of very good memories about, uh, about uh, Dublin. And I am uh, totally hopeful that uh, I will be able, uh, you know, to, to, to visit uh, Dublin in person and, uh, you know, to share my views and to have a debate with, uh, with you in such a beautiful time, town. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, I'm going to, to make some initial remarks. I know that the most important part of this kind of webinars uh, is uh, the debate, the Q&A that we are going to have after, afterwards. So I will try to, to, to be... Uh, short and to go to three main points, three main uh, issues that I want to deal with in, in, in these initial remarks. The first one is the, the outlook, the outlook of the economy. Last week, the staff uh, of the ECB presented uh, uh, the projections and the updated projections that I think that uh, you know, are the basis of the second part that I want to comment, which is our monetary policy decisions. Uh, these projections are the basis of uh, our actions, of our policy policy decisions. And finally, uh, I will make some references to the financial stability situation in the, in the euro area. I think that is something that, uh, you know, is quite relevant. I am responsible for uh, financial stability and I think that, uh, you know, I will make some comments on the, on the situation uh, of the European banks and the impact that the pandemic is having in the, in the, in the, in the European banks. And starting with the, with the outlook. Well, our baseline scenario is that uh, in, in, in this year, in 2020, we will see a very deep and profound and sharp uh, decline in GDP. 
in the area of 8.7 percent. Uh, this will be followed by a recovery in 21 and 22 of uh, 5.2 and 3.3. I think that uh, you know uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. This is the only thing that uh, that uh, is totally certain. That uh, you know the uncertainty is uh, very 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 high, very elevated. And I think that that makes uh, you know the job of forecasters much more difficult. But uh, uh, perhaps you know there is another element that uh, you know I would like to 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 stress and to highlight from the very beginning is the important drop of uh, GDP that we are going to have in the first half of the year. Uh, according to the recently reviewed uh, figures of uh, of the first quarter of this year for of this year for for uh, you know the euro area. The decline has been 3.6%, and our projection, quarter on quarter, is that in the second quarter of this year we will have a decline in the area of 13%. So, as you can as you can see, you know it's a very important drop in a very important decline, and uh, you know in the second half of the of the of the year we expect that the recovery uh, will start, and uh, you know that the recovery will resume. We are projecting uh, in the second in the third quarter of the year. Uh, you know, a recovery that will be of 8.3 uh, in, 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 in Q3 and 3.2 in Q4. With respect to, to inflation, that, uh, you know, as you know, is our main target, is the main objective of, uh, of uh, you know, in the, in the ECB according to our mandate. Well, the, the projection for 2020 is going to be uh, that uh, inflation is going to be 0.3. This is going to be driven mainly for, uh, because of the plunge uh, in oil prices. And we, es we expect that the re a recovery of the inflation rate until 2021, that the inflation rate will reach 1.3%. Uh, we will have uh, two opposed forces there. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we'll have weaker demand, and on the other hand, uh, we will have uh, you know, an upsetting uh, upper pressure related to supply constraints uh, uh, that uh, you know, partially will compensate the quicker demand and the impact on, 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 on prices. But what is more important to, to highlight is that, uh, you know, uh, our projection, our forecast of inflation in the medium term is 1.3%, that is clearly below our target of uh, close, but below to, to 2%. We have uh, two alternative scenarios, uh, a mild one that, uh, you know, the probability, uh, its probability is very, very low, at, uh, and we have a severe scenario as well but uh, the reason why we are going to maintain the three scenarios is because uh, it's an indication of the level of uncertainty that i indicated before here uh, what we have is we have started to see is that uh, you know after you know reaching the trough of the of the decline around mid april we have started to see that uh, you know the, the economy is recovering that there is, uh, you know, an uptick in the evolution of the economy that is in parallel to the to the reopening of the of the of the economy, and I think that uh, you know perhaps you know the most delicate moment of time in the in the short term outlook will be what happens once the majority of the containment measures have been lifted. I think that in that moment of time, that uh, you know, in my view, will be around autumn. We will have to see whether uh, you know the economy on its own can continue with the catching up process and how rapid the recovery is. Let me uh, now turn to the monetary policy decisions. Well, the two main elements uh, in order to, uh, you know, to decide uh, decisions that we have taken uh, are first, you know, the, 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 the anchoring of inflation expectations. This is something that we, we cannot allow. Uh, and we have seen that, uh, you know, uh, recently uh, inflation expectations have dropped, have declined quite a, quite a lot. And the second uh, has been the tightening of financial conditions that uh, you know could give rise even to a risk uh, risk of fragmentation in financial markets in the euro area. We have taken uh, three uh, kind of decisions. First, uh, you know, uh, provision of liquidity to banks uh, in very good conditions and with a very attractive pr very attractive prices. As well, we have uh, you know flexibilized uh, uh, our collateral framework in order to facilitate the access. Of the of our counterparties to our monetary policy operations. Second, our purchase program. We created, we incorporated our pandemic uh, uh, program, the PPP, that is temporary. It's an emergency program. It started with an envelope of 750 billion that was extended uh, 
and increased by 600 uh, billion euro uh, additional uh, last week. So in total, it's going to be 1,350 trillion euro. It's going to be used with flexibility, that I think that is an important characteristic, both in terms of the assets, in terms of the jurisdictions, in terms of the timing, and it's on top of our regular APP program that uh, you know, on an annual basis, uh, uh, its envelope is 360 60 billion euro. And the third kind of the third uh, uh, group of measures are prudential uh, measures. Have to, to do with measures taken by, by the SSM, by the single supervisory mechanism, uh, to relieve uh, capital requirements, uh, liquidity, uh, liquidity requirements, to facilitate uh, you know, uh, the reduction of uh, you know, the, the provision of banks uh, uh, according to the evolution of number from the loans. We, we had also some modifications of the accounting rules. And uh, I think that uh, another important measure was the suspension of the payment of dividends. Uh, now let me turn to the financial stability considerations. Uh, uh, the initial reaction of the financial markets uh, when uh, the, the pandemic started to, to escalate and the lockdown started to be imposed in different countries uh, set uh, you know, a very difficult situation, set a lot of turmoil in financial markets as you know perfectly. Uh, we saw uh, important decline, declines in prices and a lot of uh, volatility. Uh, but in the last few, few weeks, we have seen that uh, markets have uh, recovered uh, an important part of the of the losses that we had, uh, you know, in the second in the second half of March and the beginning of April. And I think that this has to do with two main elements. The first one is the uh, the reopening of the of the of the economy, and the second one is the policy policy response policy response uh, coming uh, from uh, fiscal authorities and monetary monetary uh, uh, authorities. Um, it's important to bear in mind in order to understand the impact that the pandemic is having in, in, in financial markets, in financial market stability, that uh, pre-corona we had uh, vulnerabilities in, the, in financial markets. For instance, uh, high valuation in some markets of uh, the, the, the price of assets were extremely elevated. We had also, you know, a, a quite a, a high level of debt. The leverage both in the private and the public sector was, was uh, elevated as well. Uh, we had some issues in the asset management uh, industry in terms of leverage, in terms of uh, risky and illiquid assets in the portfolio of the, of the of asset managers. And finally, uh, perhaps, you know, the most uh, relevant characteristic in terms of, uh, you know, potential vulnerabilities of the financial landscape in the euro area uh, uh, was uh, the low profitability of the European, the European banks. As you know perfectly, the pandemic uh, implies an unprecedented macro shock that uh, has aggravated and amplified uh, many of these uh, previous imbalances. And I think that now, you know, we are confronting, we are going to face two main uh, financial stability risks. The first one is the sustainability of uh, public finances in the medium term. I think that in the short term, in the short term, fiscal policy has a very important role to play. It has been, you know, the first line of defense. But uh, once the pandemic is, is, is over and the downturn is, is, is over, well, uh, we will have a legacy. And the legacy will be a higher uh, public debt ratio that we will have to, to, to address in order to be back to uh, the perception and to the situation of sustainability of public finances. And the second uh, main risk for financial stability has to do with the profitability of the European, the European banks. Uh, before Corona, the profitability of the European banks was uh, very, very, very low, and this was requested. Uh, this was reflected in the in the in the in the valuation of the European the European banks uh, uh, prices. The price the price to book was in the area and was in the area of 0.4. That is uh, extremely low in comparison with other with other with other uh, you know banks in other parts of the of the, of the world. Now, uh, you know, even the, the, the valuations are even, uh, are even lower. We have seen, you know, a decline in the prices of, uh, of, uh, of the share of banks of 30% uh, with respect to the, the level that they had pre-corona. And uh, uh, this is a clear indication that we have a problem with, uh, you know, the valuation and uh, the profitability of the European banks. Our calculation is that the, the return on equity now of the European banks on average is in the area of 3%. 
And uh, the problem is not the average. The problem is uh, as well that there is dispersion around uh, around that. This is uh, you know something that uh, in my view now is perhaps uh, you know the most important uh, risk that we have to confront in terms of financial stability. And this is going to be an issue that is going to be around for 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 for, for a while while, and that it will be very important to, to address in the in the in the in the near term. Let me conclude with some remarks. Well, we are living, we are going through an unprecedented shock. This is something that is quite, uh, quite uh, obvious. The only certain, uh, certain uh, issue is that uh, the decline in, in, in GDP in the first half of the year has been uh, very deep, very sharp. Uh, we believe that uh, you know the, the, the main question mark uh, over the next uh, months is going to be the evolution of the economy in the second in the second half of the year. Uh, um, uh, we believe that uh, risk continue to be tilted to the to the to the to the to the to the, to the downside, and we also believe that uh, uh, well, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, one important element will be you know the evolution of the pandemic. You know, I think that uh, you know if there is a second wave uh, of infections uh, in in autumn. Well, you know, the impact uh, will be additionally uh, detrimental to the, to, the, to the evolution of the economy and to financial stability. You have seen today that the OECD has produced uh, its figures and uh, they distinguish, uh, you know, between two scenarios. The first one is with one shock and the second one is with, uh, you know, at, uh, at, uh, with a second with, uh, with two shocks. I think that uh, policy response is going to be key, as I have said before. Uh, this is a force that has opposed, uh, you know, the macro shock uh, implemented or uh, produced by the pandemic. Uh, monetary policy in the euro area, uh, sure, that has reduced the tensions in markets, um, and uh, we have reduced as well, you know, volatility and the possibility of fragmentation in, in, in different markets, mainly in the sovereign market. That is the the first element of consideration, and uh, you know, is the first line of defense when. when uh, when uh, where we have to to to, to act, uh, I think that national fiscal policies have been uh, as well very relevant, uh, but not all the countries have a, a similar fiscal space, and the capacity to respond is uh, you know, we have important disparities there. Uh, so this could pr produce an an, 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 an uh, uh, a situation that uh, you know we have an unlevel playing field. Um, that uh, you know could give rise to disparities in terms of the response, and uh, at the end of the, the 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 day, to potential fragmentation of the single market that could be you know something very negative for everybody. And uh, just to final finalize, I would like to emphasize the importance of having a common European fiscal response uh, to avoid uh, to overburden the public finances of countries with uh, high debt. Something that's relevant. But it's not only that, it's as well, you know, because I think that now uh, of a European fiscal response, as the one that has been put forward by the French and the German governments, and uh, the recent proposal uh, uh, set by the, by the Commission, is important because, because it sends a uh, you know, very clear signal of the political commitment uh, uh, to deal, a political commitment from the European Council to deal with, uh, you know, the consequences of the pandemic and to, to start the process of recovery of our, of, our, of our economies. And there is something that is quite, uh, quite important. Uh, monetary policy cannot be the only game in town. We have to, to act uh, collectively. At the, at the European the European level, and I think that, uh, as I have said before, that would be, you know, a very important and relevant complement for our monetary policy stance. And I would uh, stop there, Patrick, huh? because otherwise I'm going to consume more time of, uh, of what I I promised at the beginning. Thank you very much, Luis. That was uh, covering the ground very effectively and starting our our discussion. Um, you know. Listening to you there, I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice to be back and have all those difficult challenges to deal with? But then I thought maybe I'll leave it to younger men and women. <laughs> well, um, the questions will go in many different directions. Uh, let, let, me, let me start with one area which already was in place before the, the pandemic crisis, but it still gets so much discussion in the, in the media. In the, if you, you read the comments in the financial, below Financial Times articles, people are complaining constantly about negative interest rates. 
and the interest rates, policy interest rates of the ECB, some of the policy interest rates have been negative now for uh, six years. Um, and you mentioned the problem of bank profitability and banks complain that they're unprofitable because of negative interest rates. You, you think that has some validity? You think that to the extent that it has validity, the tiered interest rate structure that the ECB introduced last year has removed that problem. Uh, what do you think in general? Uh, Bank of England and the Federal Reserve have said no to negative interest rates. Why is it right for the ECB when it's wrong for those other banks? Well, first of all, what I have to say is that the policy of negative interest rates, I think that uh, you know, it has been important uh, uh, in order to, to foster the, 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 the evolution of the European economy over the last uh, five, six years since the policy was implemented. I think that is behind uh, the recovery that we had uh, until 2018. And, uh, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, is quite, uh, quite obvious. You know, negative interest rates have played a role in terms of uh, fostering aggregate demand, uh, investment, consumption, and I think that it has been positive. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, correctly, uh, Patrick, as usual, you know, the potential impact on the profitability of banks. You know, our calculations is that uh, the main factors behind the low profitability of the European banks are structural. Have to do with the lack of consolidation, with excess capacity, um, have to do with a cost to income ratio that is very, very, very high. And that, uh, you know, in, in net terms, negative interest rates uh, didn't have, eh? uh, uh, you know, an impact on the profitability. And even that uh, taking into consideration the, the, the recovery that the negative interest rates uh, you know, produced, it could be you know even uh, net positive for the for the for the banks. You can see that uh, over, for instance, the last three four years and before the crisis, before the pandemic crisis, uh, well, uh, the, the levels of provisioning uh, of uh, of the European banks started to be reduced thanks to the recovery and that uh, you know the flow of non-performing loans was uh, clearly in, in decline. So uh, we believe that uh, the low profitability of the European banks um, has to do with the structural actions. Um, I think that is very important that uh, we give a, a close look uh, to uh, you know, the cost structure of the, of the, of the European banks, uh, the question of excess, excess capacity. I think that as well, you know, the potential competition coming from uh, FinTech um, and Big Tech, and I think that consolidation should be something that, uh, you know, uh, it was important before Corona. And I think that uh, uh, post-Corona will be uh, even more relevant in terms of, uh, you know, trying to, to reduce the cost structure of the, of the, of the European banks. Well, I have a, a question here from, from Peter McLuhan, who's a board member at the Institute here. Um, you already mentioned the uncertainty about uh, economic forecasting, but just just how bad is this situation of forecasting right now? How, how reliable is economic forecasting, given the uncertainty about the pandemic itself and the uncertainty about how the economies will recover, whether there need to be structural changes, in the hospitality sector, transportation, uh, and so forth. And then, of course, the Brexit, which is very relevant for Ireland, comes in as an additional factor, but also, I think, relevant potentially for, for the European economy and the Euro area economy as a whole. Uh, so, so just how uncertain are you? Is it a dramatic change in uncertainty? Is it any point in making forecasts at this stage? Well, uh, I think that, I think that uh, as I have said before, uncertainty is, 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 uh, is huge. Uh, I think that uh, uh, you know, for, for you know, forecasting uh, the situation is uh, extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, uh, there is a joke that uh, in Spain that uh, forecasting is especially difficult uh, when you refer to the future you know, with respect to the past. Uh, well, for sure that uh, everybody, uh, you know, can have uh, the right, uh, the right uh, projections. But uh, the only thing that uh, we know for sure. Uh, so far, is that in the first half of the year, between March and uh, at the end of this uh, this uh, this quarter, the second quarter, uh, the impact uh, has been huge. 
you know, in the first uh, uh, quarter, uh, you know, the decline in GDP was 3.6%. And our projection from, for the second quarter of this year is that uh, the decline, the, the drop in GDP is going to be in the area of 13%. Huh? It's something that quarter on quarter I have never seen in my life. Huh? Um, so uh, this is the only thing that uh, we know, that, uh, you know, the impact has been, uh, you know, huge and enormous in the, in the first half of the year. That now, in the in the half of the uh, indicators, is that uh, the trough of the of the of the of the decline was reached in mid April, more or less. Then after that, uh, when uh, you know, in parallel with the, the reopening of the of the different economies. We have seen, you know, an important uh, recovery, and that the indicators from very low levels are becoming better, and better, and better. I think that uh, you know the main driver, as I have said before, is uh, you know the, the the lift of the containment measures, uh, and perhaps you know the main question mark that uh, we have is what's going to happen once uh, you know the containment measures have been have been. Uh, totally raised. What's going to happen with the with the with the economy, regardless of the possibility of a second wave? That is something that uh, is an exogenous variable. Um, I think that there the policy response is going to be very relevant. Uh, you know, we are making a, a huge effort in terms of fixed fiscal and monetary expansion. Uh, we believe that uh, you know we will be able to come back to return to the pre-corona uh, GDP levels in two years, but uh, there are a lot of question marks, eh? a lot of uncertainty about uh, the recovery path. And I think that the recovery path is going to be, uh, you know, key. It's going to be key, uh, not only in terms of the economic performance, it's going to be key, for instance, for the, for, the, for, the, for the banks. If the recovery is rapid, for sure that the impact of the pandemic will be much more, much more limited. If the recovery is much, uh, much, uh, much more timid, then uh, you can have, uh, you know, a, an additional detrimental impact that, uh, uh, despite the fact that uh, banks are much more resilient than they were, you know, 10 years ago. But the impact on profitability, for instance, that is the main variable that we are looking at uh, carefully now, uh, could be much, much, much bigger. So uh, uncertainty is huge, very difficult times to, to, to make projections about, uh, about um, uh, you know, the economy and the financial variables. Mm, and but uh, well, uh, the only thing that we do, we know for sure is that the impact in the first half has been has been enormous, and that uh, you know we have started now uh, a certain level of uh, recovery. Uh, but the question is how this is going to evolve after you know we we, we lift uh, the, the containment measures. I have a few questions here about um, about corporate profitability and uh, the situation with. Sm small firms, medium firms, even large firms, uh, this shutdown, whatever happens in the future, this shutdown is causing a, a huge liquidity drain on, on many, many, um, many, many firms. And, and I'm wondering, do you think enough has been done uh, to, to cope with this situation? Uh, one of the questioners here is Brendan Ryan, uh, who, who recalls being uh, with you in the EFC many years ago. And, and he, he wonders whether whether governments have done enough to deal with the uh, loan problems that bank, that firms are, are experiencing. Some firms cannot access liquidity. Some firms can, but are indebting themselves to a level that may make it very difficult for them to, to move forward, even if they have viable business plans after the pandemic. And, uh, is this, there have been a certain number of measures, governments have put in guarantee programs, sometimes it's an 80% guarantee, sometimes it's an 85% guarantee. That's not enough for very cautious banks. They say, I, I still don't want to lose my 15% or my 20%. Uh, on the other hand, governments might end up writing off a lot of this debt on these, pay out on these guarantees uh, to an extent that is hard for them to afford. Where do you think that stands and should the ECB be doing more? Well, we have done what we can do. That is to to to, to deliver a lot of liquidity in very good, very good conditions to the banks. Uh, you know, if you look at our TLTROs uh, operations, 
you can see that we have improved the conditions, that we have created a new instrument, that is what we call Peltro. And, uh, well, uh, I suppose that, uh, well, the take up of these uh, instruments will be very high, uh, and that the banks uh, will, will, will make, uh, you know, uh, full employment of uh, these, these, these instruments. But this is a necessary condition. Uh, I think that with the level of uncertainty that we referred to before, uh, I think that, uh, you know, it could be uh, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, compared with a big market failure in the sense that banks uh, with uh, this huge level of uncertainty, they are, uh, they become much more prudent than, than, than usual. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, the provision of liquidity is a necessary condition but uh, there is a sufficient condition as well. And this has to do with the, the action of the governments. I think that uh, uh, government uh, guarantee schemes are going to be very, 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 very important. I think that the combination of the liquidity that we are giving to the banks and after, uh, and after you know, the, the, the schemes, uh, the guarantee schemes that has been, have been approved and laid out by, by governments, uh, are very very relevant in order to guarantee you know the provision of uh, of finance to the to the to the medium companies the small companies and the large and the large uh, the large corporations um, i think that liquidity is going to be key uh, is another uh, is another uh, feature you know, of uncertainty that we are we are we are living and i think that uh, liquidity is going to be and lending is going to be key uh, mainly because, well, the drop and the decline in revenues of corporates uh, has been quite substantial. And so in order to, to go through this period of hibernation um, that we had, I think that uh, you know, liquidity is going to be a very relevant element. There are other, other actions by governments, for instance, uh, uh, temporary unemployment schemes, is something that uh, you know, is going to be as well uh, uh, an important uh, policy action in order to reduce uh, the costs uh, of the of the of the of the of the corporates, and also you know all kind of moratoria in terms of payment of taxes, uh, social charges, etc., etc., etc. But all in all, if you allow me to say, I think that uh, you know the, the 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 main main element in my view in order to have a rapid recovery is that we try to maximize if, to maximize the uh, the number of of enterprises and corporates that survive right? you know this uh, period of lockdown um, if uh, you know an important percentage if a very high percentage uh, a very elevated percentage of uh, you know corporates are able to survive i am totally sure that uh, the recovery phase that uh, you know is going to be uh, very important and key in order to determine uh, you know the future impact of the pandemic. I think that it will be much, uh, much, uh, much higher huh? than uh, if uh, we are not able to 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 make that uh, an important part of the of the of the entrepreneurial uh, uh, you know uh, uh, tissue uh, survives survives after the the the, the, the pandemic. So. Uh, to keep uh, uh, under control the costs of uh, corporates and simultaneously to, to the provision of liquidity, in my view, are the two elements that we have to, to use in order to facilitate an important recovery in the, in, in the, over the next months of, the, of our European economies. Hmm. Yeah. Now, you know, we've been talking about all the bad things, uh, but one questioner here, Kevin Callanan, reminds me that um, in all of this bad news story, there's the stock market seemed to be uh, pricing much less of a crisis than you might otherwise uh, suppose. Do you have an explanation for that or an interpretation? Does the ECB, does the governing council look at, at the stock market? It's a relevant factor. Or, or, um, what do you have to say about the stock market? Well, I think that the stock market is a very, is a very good indicator. It's something that we could look at uh, closely, uh, mainly when, when, when we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, mainly you know the valuations of uh, you know financial financial stocks, no, um, uh, and I think that uh, you know it's an important indicator as as well, and as well, uh, you know, the a positive evolution of the stock market is something that uh, you know we take into consideration when we analyze you know the financial conditions of our of our markets equity. Mm -hmm. is an important part 
of uh, you know the, the the finance of uh, you know the private the private sector. So uh, I think that uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, what I have to say is that uh, you know perhaps you know the decline in the when the when the pandemic started to escalate and the lockdown measures were imposed was you know very 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 sharp. Uh, so uh, now, as uh, the situation is is different, and we are, you know, governments are lifting the, the containment measures, we have started to see uh, a, a recovery. Uh, sometimes uh, equity markets, as you know perfectly, uh, overshoot. Huh? Uh, you know, I would not dare to say what's happening now. You know, because I am not an expert on, on the stock on the stock markets. But uh, I think that uh, perhaps you know is the perception that uh, the reopening of the economy is advancing quite well that uh, you know after a period of three months uh, well uh, of lockdown more or less well uh, you know an important part of the of uh, of, of uh, corporates will be able to survive and that we will be back to, to, to normality and that perhaps you know the recovery will be uh, more rapid than uh, our models indicate now mm -hmm. so uh, well it's something that we have to take into consideration we are looking at uh, some people are saying that there is a divide between uh, the stock market, and, uh, you know, the real economy. But at the end of the day, uh, I think that uh, you know that divide, uh, you know, the gap should be bridged. And I hope that uh, you know the stock market, at least partially, is right with respect to the to the forecasts that they are and the bets that they are doing. Um, there, apart from the companies, the stock market. Uh, of course, there are the sovereigns, and that's linked very much to the uh, the overall policy goal of the ECB to get inflation back up uh, to the in intended objective level. Um, early on in the, this pandemic event, we had a lot of volatility in government uh, debt markets. Spreads moved out in per peripheral countries, or some in some countries, whatever you might call them, um, and now that's. Been brought somewhat under control, I think, by uh, the initiatives of the of the ECB and its uh, pandemic uh, purchase program, emergency purchase program. There is another approach that the Japanese Bank of Japan adopted a few years ago when they were trying to get the in inflation rate up, which they haven't entirely succeeded in doing. And that was to say, okay, we're just going to be prepared to buy any Japanese government bonds as in order to keep. The long-term yield, the ten-year yield, uh, n no higher than zero percent. That was their particular objective. But that idea of an open-ended commitment to, to holding to a particular rate, even spread, spread a yield, even if it was a different yield for different countries, would that be a, a tool that the ECB could safely use? Uh, is it something that you've considered? Is it desirable? Uh, the Americans did it in the Second World War. Um, and they, had, they, they abandoned that policy in 1951 when it was becoming a little bit, um, exit is not as easy as entry to that policy, but still, it, it's something that many people have suggested. What, what do you think? Well, you know perfectly, Patrick, because uh, you have been part of the, of the, of the game in the, in the past and you were a member of the, of the governing council, that there is something that is different uh, from uh, the US and from Japan and from the UK in the case of the of the euro area is that we have 19 sovereign bonds uh, and uh, well that's uh, you know an additional i would not say that is an additional complication but it's an additional element that we have to bear in mind when we implement our monetary our monetary policy what i can tell you is that uh, uh, well our 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 policy uh, has clearly uh, uh, signaled that uh, we cannot allow, you know, an additional fragmentation of sovereign markets. Mm? That uh, if we see, you know, a, a widening of, of, of spreads, uh, then uh, the monetary policy transmission mechanism of our uh, of that, uh, you know, we 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 try to to, to have in place could be uh, dramatically, uh, you know, affected and negatively affected. And so that uh, you know, uh, in order to to, to send uh, you know our our monetary policy decisions and uh, the impulses of monetary policy to all the jurisdictions of the euro area, we cannot allow you know uh, an additional fragmentation in sovereign markets. That's uh, you know the approach that we have we have we have used. That's uh, you know the the, the main idea uh, behind and the main target behind our pandemic program. 
uh, is to deal with uh, you know a very difficult situation to try to get rid of the tail risks of the of the of the euro area, and uh, I think that we have been successful. You know, we have seen that over the last uh, few weeks uh, there is an important narrowing of uh, of uh, of spreads. No. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's the way that we have in order to guarantee that uh, our monetary policy decisions are transmitted uh, to all the jurisdictions of the euro area. You know, you know I often um, think that some of the people who don't really so much like the purchasing programs, particularly for, for sovereign that they don't like to see the huge volumes that are being bought and those uh, if you the graph I don't have it in front of me here to show you but the graph of the the amount of, of uh, bonds on the ECB's balance sheet going up and up and up when when the Japan announced their um, th this policy of, of freezing the or, or putting a ceiling on the yield of long term long term bonds that they called yield curve control after that they didn't have to buy as many because the market just said oh I see there's no no point in trying this because these Yields are going to be steady. They didn't have to buy very much. So actually, the critics of this approach might might be wrong if they um, if they think it's going to um, if they think it's a, a threat to expanding the balance sheet. I I promised myself I wouldn't wouldn't allow any questions before ten past three on the German constitutional court. But now it's ten past three and. Uh, <laughs> One question, which um, which is, has been sitting here for uh, all that time from Blair Horan, um, and he has a long memory. He, he says, uh, Carl Otto Pohl. Uh, Carl Otto Pohl was, uh, was the president of the Bundesbank in the 1980s, and, uh, until 1990, I think. And he told the ECOFIN on the 8th of September 1990, I'm told, I didn't verify this, but Blair <laughs> says, that in the event of a conflict between price stability and other economic objectives, the ECB has no choice but to give priority to its primary objective. There can be no compromise on that. Now, that's the quotation from Carl Otto Pearl. Uh, and Blair asks the question, has the German Constitutional Court undermined that commitment? And I think what he has in mind is that, uh, as, as we know, the German Constitutional Court said that in looking at in unconventional policies, ECB needs to make sure, because of the treaty, that these policies are effective and proportional. And that means looking at side effects. But that means that if you're looking at side effects, does that not mean that the side effects are now elevated to being the same uh, equivalent importance to price stability? Um, well, I, I expect you to have a staunch protection, uh, defense now of the German constitutional court position or a comment on it. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, first of all, I am, I am not going to comment on uh, you know the, the the ruling of the of the German Constitutional Court. It's not my my role. What uh, I can say is that we are uh, the ECB is a European institution. It's a true European institution. It's under the jurisdictional umbrella uh, of the European Court of Justice. We are under the political control of the European Parliament, and as well, you know, the, even the the Court of Auditors. Uh, uh, continuously is looking at our operational efficiency. So uh, we are a European institution, and we have to respond to uh, you know European, European, uh, foreign, European institutions as, as well. Um, um, I think that uh, whenever we ha we we take uh, uh, you know a decision of monetary policy. Well, it's very important to bear in mind that we are continuously analyzing, looking at, reviewing uh, pros, cons, costs, benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not put uh, our monetary policy in a sort of ivory tower at all. Mm -hmm. We analyze, you know, all, all, all other, 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 other elements, and we, when we have, a, when we take a decision, we believe that this is the best in order to meet our primary target, as we have said, that is price stability and the definition of price stability that, 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 we, that we have. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's part of, uh, you know, let's say, a more, uh, you know, complete uh, uh, analysis of the potential implications, and for sure that we have, uh, we have referred to side effects in the, in the, in the, in the past. Uh, tiering, for instance, uh, you know, is a measure that was taken because we were, we were aware 
of the potential impact that uh, our policies could have, uh, you know, on, on banks. No, so uh, uh, we will continue uh, uh, implementing uh, monetary policies that uh, you know are directed and targeted at meeting our our primary target. Uh, this is something that uh, you know we will discuss as well as, as, as well as part of the of the uh, of the strategy review that we are going to start that has been postponed because of the pandemic but uh, continuously i can assure you that uh, in my experience in the governing council all the decisions that we have taken have been based uh, on uh, you know a very let's say broad based uh, analysis and research and that uh, well uh, that uh, we have uh, evaluated uh, the pros and the cons and if we decide to take a measure it's because we believe that uh, you know the, the, the benefits of the measure clearly are superior to uh, you know the costs of the and the side effects of this measure um, so inflation of course the main the main objective of the ecb it has undershot its below but close to two percent goal for many years now um, despite all the all the efforts one possibility is that in the years ahead as you get back on target it might be sensible and correct in terms of the overall policy to overshoot the target for a, a few years in order to get an average a backward looking average that's below or close to two percent uh, over say a 10-year period rather than just saying well bygones are bygones sorry we didn't deliver two percent inflation up to now but we're going to do it what do you think about that? Is there a case for an overshoot so that you have over the average you get to the two percent? Well, this is going to be a very important part of our strategy review. Uh, uh, this is something that uh, you know we will we have not been able to even to reach you know because I think that this you know the the definition of price stability uh, is perhaps you know the 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 first part of our strategy review. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were not able to be there. Uh, uh, I know perfectly that uh, uh, the staff and Philip Lane have started to, to analyze different alternatives. Uh, you know, I have an open-minded, uh, uh, an open-minded uh, approach with respect to, to this, uh, you know, definition of uh, of inflation. I think that it will be part of our discussions, but I do not want to be judged. What's what's going to be, you know, my position? Uh, you know, the possibility of uh, overshooting and undershooting. Um, to, to, to reach an average has pros and cons, but I am. Uh, uh, I think that it could be uh, to speculate, uh, and uh, you know, I, I want to wait until I have you know all the analysis and all the research from the staff and you know the different proposals that Philip is going to put forward uh, before taking a personal position on that. It's a funny business inflation right now because nobody knows what inflation is this month and next month and last month because we weren't able to buy anything. Um, well, we were able to buy some things, but there were many things that we couldn't buy, and therefore the prices were either zero or infinity, depending on how you look at it. So, uh, in this this period is a very strange period. Probably, in some ways, prices have gone up quite sharply. Uh, uh, in 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 other ways, it, prices probably would be depressed because of the, the downturn of economic activity. Uh, what what a risk do you attach to a kind of Wish effect that yes, inflation will be weak in the recovery because the uh, economic activity is low, but then so much liquidity would have been pumped out into the markets. The governments would have been would still be spending a huge deficit. Uh, you think there might be a swish, an upward swish of inflation, say two, three, four years ahead? Well, this is something that we have. Through. I think that you're you're totally right. You know, this is a risk that uh, we'll have to to look at and to monitor very, very, very closely. Uh, you know, our projection is that uh, you know I referred before in my initial in my initial remarks uh, about our inflation forecast. Well, we believe that uh, in 2020 inflation is going to be very low, uh, on average 0.3 uh, for the euro area, uh, and that we will see you know recovery over time over the next two years to a level that is going to be 1.3. That is clearly below uh, the the forecast that we have. Uh, pre-corona. Uh, we have uh, downgraded 
uh, our inflation and our inflation forecasts. I think that it has to do with uh, the evolution of the, the price of, uh, of oil, and uh, you know, energy energy prices prices are going to play a very important a very important role. But I think that there is something that we have to look at uh, as well. Is uh, well, we are living uh, in a very strange uh, times, uh, as you have said, Patrick. And uh, I suppose that uh, you know the structure of consumption of the basket of goods uh, consumed by the European households during the times of the of the pandemic has changed uh, quite a lot. Uh, well, uh, I suppose that during the lockdown, people didn't go so often to the to the pump, uh, and so that uh, the reduction in oil prices uh, didn't have you know uh, the impact that theoretically has according to the to the weight uh, to the weight in. The weightings of the of the of the inflation of the inflation index. So um, uh, simultaneously, on the other on the other side, uh, you can for sure that if you look at the evolution of the prices of food, immediately you realize that uh, they have been you know raising more than usual huh? uh, during the times of the pandemic. So I think that we have to be careful. Uh, I think that uh, well, uh, as we have said before. Uh, uh, well, uh, inflation perceptions uh, from households and the inflation f official indexes. Perhaps uh, you know there is uh, there is uh, there is a gap, and I hope that uh, you know once uh, the, the economy uh, normalizes, I think that they will converge uh, 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 again. But uh, you know, our projection. Uh, and pure economic sources. The first one is that the pandemic is going to produce a weakening of demand for goods and services. And secondly, that uh, you know, we are going to have you know, an, upper, an upper pressure huh? uh, because uh, perhaps uh, you know, we will have some supply constraints. Huh? Uh, so we have to balance both in order to try to, 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 to reach and to, 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 to reach you know, uh, you know, a, concrete, uh, a concrete forecast. Um, but again, you know, these are times of huge uncertainty. Uh, uh, we will have to look at, uh, you know, the evolution of uh, of, uh, of prices over the next months. I think that this one is very important. How inflation evolves uh, once uh, the economy is uh, reopened, and I am totally sure that we will avoid, uh, you know, the risk of uh, having, you know, an important uh, increase in inflation over the next months. And that's not part of our projection. That's not part of our, of our baseline. Let me turn to another question. We, we um, have a government formation process happening in, in Ireland. The election was way back in, in February, and at, at the moment there's a, a, a discussion among three parties, one of which is the Green Party, the smaller of the three parties, but it's a, a very um, uh, closely uh, looking at a variety of government policies in, on climate change. Now, the ECB is not governed by what the Irish Green Party or any Green Party or any political party <laughs> says, but still, it's of, of considerable interest here. But, and what's been noticed is that the ECB buys bonds of this company and that company, and actually more or less any company with a, an investment uh, grade, including companies that might be regarded as rather uh, carbon heavy, um, carbon intensive uh, companies. Uh, in order to maintain general public support for, and indeed consistent with the secondary mandate of the ECB, which is to support the economic policies in the Euro area, European Union, um, would it not be good to have a negative list and, and stop buying the bonds of, um, you know, some category of, of uh, carbon rich companies? Well, uh, as you have said, uh, climate change is going to be one of the main objectives of the of the new commission. They are going to put forward. Well, they have put forward, uh, and they have proposed uh, uh, a plan. Uh, now, perhaps you know this plan has been overlooked because of the situation, the concrete situation that we have suffered uh, during the the times of the of the of the pandemic. But uh, I think that. Uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, is going to be a continuous uh, uh, objective uh, in all the policies, all the economic policies implemented by the by the by the European the European authorities. And if you want my opinion, I think that you know uh, we have. Uh, it's not only because climate change is, is uh, you know, and to try to minimize the impact of climate change is good. Uh, 
in itself, I think that uh, you know the Europeans we have a competitive advantage, a competitive edge in that uh, in that regard, and uh, for sure that is going to be part of the of the recovery plan, and that uh, well, will be decided by the different authorities, and that investments uh, in order to minimize the impact of climate change uh, will be will be one of the priorities of the of the European Commission when they uh, make an assessment of the different uh, uh, you know, plans that the different governments present in order to obtain uh, resources from, from uh, you know, the, 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 the recovery, the recovery uh, funds that are going to be uh, approved by the, by the European Council and put forward by the European, the European Commission. With respect to the role of the ECB, what I have to say here is that uh, you know, we are analyzing quite in detail you know, the impact of transition uh, towards a green economy is going to have an impact on the balance sheet of many financial institutions and we are looking at very carefully. Secondly, uh, we are applying now, now uh, you know, the uh, green criteria hmm, to, uh, you know, uh, the, the investments of our non-monetary policy portfolios now is something that we are doing now. And, uh, you know, with respect to, uh, you know, what's going to happen with monetary policy, well, I think that uh, climate change considerations uh, should be part of uh, let's say you know the analysis uh, and uh, of the future solvency of the different assets that we buy uh, mm, uh, we have to pay you know when, when uh, you know perfectly that we pay a lot of attention to, to the, the risk management uh, uh, situation of uh, of uh, of our balance sheet because our balance sheet is getting getting bigger and bigger and we have a lot of uh, corporates in, in in our balance sheet and i think that uh, you know the issue of climate change is something that uh, you know we should take into consideration but embedded in the solvency rating of uh, you know the different the different assets we are dealing with the rating agencies uh, we are asking to have uh, you know much more into consideration the potential impact of uh, climate change in the solvency of the different corporates uh, and i hope that uh, you know this criteria will become increasingly more relevant uh, in the in the in the rating uh, delivered by the different uh, agencies and that uh, and that we will we will uh, you know uh, uh, include that consideration in uh, our uh, risk management uh, assessment um one 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 type of bond that you don't buy is bank bonds and, and some people wonder why you don't buy bank bonds i think i know but um what's your answer to that well it's a question of uh, you know avoiding you know a sort of let's say uh, it, it could be you know it could be you know an internal conflict we are supervisors and simultaneously you know on the one hand you're supervising banks and on the other hand you're buying you know uh, 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 securities issued by 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 banks and there is a potential let's say, conflict of interest that uh, I suppose that everybody can understand. When we come out of all this, the economic structure may have changed. And one of the things that may have changed is a consolidation of uh, power in, in larger co companies. We may have less competition. Smaller companies may go to the wall, their assets and their business uh, absorbed into larger companies. Do, do you worry about this for Europe or, or do you think uh, uh, it's quite important for Europe to have large, powerful companies to compete in the wider global market? Well, I would say it's something that is quite, <laughs> that is quite obvious. What uh, I would like to have is very competitive European companies. I think that uh, uh, I, I always put uh, an example. When you look at uh, you know the market valuations of the traditional large uh, uh, European utilities or even the European banks, and you compare with, uh, for instance, you know the tech companies in the, the valuations of the tech companies in the U.S., you realize you know the big gap that uh, we have there. Um, compare you know the, the the market value of Facebook or Amazon or Google with uh, you know the, the large uh, uh, european traditional utilities and you realize that uh, you know there there is a uh, uh, a big gap i think that uh, you know it's not as much the question of having you know let's say national champions or european champions i think that uh, europe has to invest much more uh, in knowledge in research um, i think that we need uh, tech uh, companies tech uh, really real uh, you know european tech uh, tech uh, companies 
and uh, well, uh, and that we have to create, uh, you know, the, the environment and the atmosphere in order to have, you know, companies with such high high valuations. No, um, that's the main problem. No, uh, with respect to competition policy, I think that uh, if uh, you allow me, Patrick, I would like to say that uh, now, you know, all the state aid uh, framework, uh, the regulation framework, uh, has been has been removed, and I think that for the for the correct uh, reasons. But I think that this is something that we have to 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 you know to resume. Uh, uh, the competition policy rules uh, have to be in place again once uh, you know then the, the pandemic is over. And uh, because uh, well, uh, I think that it's very important to have a level playing field in terms of uh, competition to avoid fragmentation of the single market. And uh, in order to do that, I think that uh, a state date uh, regulation is key. And uh, well, uh, we have been uh, through very difficult and strange times. But uh, once the pandemic is over, and hopefully it will be will be will be will be over, I think that we should uh, restart and resume, uh, you know, with the implementation of the state aid rules. Luis, thank you very much. You have answered so many questions. I, I didn't even acknowledge that so many people asked different questions. Uh, Dan O'Brien, Ray Leiden, Owen Faherty, Kadeen Rossi, Robert Short, and I sort of mix those into into my um, into my uh, uh, posed questions for you. And I think you um, did a remarkable job fielding them all in in different questions. I, I was I was asked to ask another question, um, but then I a, a Reuters report on that the ECB is is uh, set up a task force to to look at the idea of a, a European bad bank. To uh, and, but the ECB declined to comment on on this matter on, on whether it was working on a bad bank scheme. So I know that the answer would be that you declined to comment on this question. So I will not bother to ask you. No, no, no. I am totally. You know, I'm quite to, to be quite transparent. You know, I am a little bit surprised when I see these uh, these kind of informations. But uh, well, uh, we have we haven't we haven't had any sort of serious discussion about uh, this instrument. Well, you know, I, when, when I was finance minister in Spain, well, uh, and in Ireland as well, uh, you incorporated bad banks, no, and uh, as much when companies, no, and it was, an, you know, it was a powerful instrument in order to clean up the balance sheet of the banks, no, both in the case of Ireland and in the case of Spain with the saving banks, no, but, uh, well, we didn't have any sort of discussion of that kind uh, at the European level in the ECB. All right. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you Great very much. My talk. pleasure. Uh, we'll all have you back best. again, I hope, in the future. Thanks to the audience and thanks to all the sure. questioners. <laughs> I hope you've got good connections, right. everybody. I know that sometimes it can, can be a bit uh, patchy in these webinars when we're using multiple locations. Um, great success, success in this event. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Patrick. Hmm?